my wife and I actually have a company called Couples Academy. And for the last 12 years, we've been working with couples, helping them by placing them on the path to fulfillment. And so we are trained marriage and family coaches and infidelity recovery specialists. And so most of the couples that we deal with are typically couples in crisis, those on the verge of divorce, uh, those who've experienced an affair and are looking to recover. And so oftentimes people say, well, how did you get into that? Well, what's the passion for that? Well, the passion for helping restore marriages is that the fact that three years into our relationship, we were on the verge of divorce. And we suffered bad times. And at that time, we didn't see any future. The future actually looked bleak. We felt like throwing in the towel, calling it quits, and just giving up. And it was at that particular time where uh, we were young into our marriage, we had little kids, we were suffering financial challenges. Everything that could go wrong in our relationship did go wrong. And I remember we came into the marriage with so many issues from our past because all of us have what is called a family marinade where you're soaked and saturated into certain communication patterns and emotional reactions and perspectives that you bring into that union that oftentimes can cause conflict. And so in our attempt to save the marriage, we were actually making things worse. Why? Because as long as we were trying to fix the marriage, and as long as I felt like she was the reason why our marriage was the way that it was, and in her mind, I was the reason why the marriage was the way that it was, Fixing the marriage was indirectly attempting to fix our spouse. And when we did that, things got absolutely worse. And it was in that moment that we learned how to stay in our own circle and realize that the lowest common denominator in every relationship that you enter into is you. Because you take you everywhere you go. And so when I decided to look at myself, things began to change. So year three into the marriage, when a divorce was impending, either she could divorce me or I was willing to divorce her. But it was in that moment that I made the decision to divorce me from myself. To divorce myself from my poor communication habits because I was a verbal assassin. To divorce myself from my false sense of masculinity that did not work in favor of my union. And when I began to make changes in me, things happened. Because I remember quite clearly as if it happened yesterday, one day we were in the midst of a fight and we were sitting on the edge of the bed and tears were rolling down my wife's face and she looked at me straight in my eyes and said, you know what, Asani, you declitterized me. And I said, declitterized? Like I never even heard of the word before. What does that even mean? But in essence, what she was saying is that I robbed her of her womanhood. I stripped her of her femininity with my word. And we were on a path of destruction. And it was not until I began to do internal work within myself, likewise her doing her own work, that things began to change. But there was one thing that actually turned our ship around. You want to know what it was? Intimacy. Intimacy. Into me, see. Into me, see. See, because there were walls that were constructed between us that kept us from entering into each other's worlds. And so when we embrace intimacy, allowing her to see inside my heart and see inside my mind and see inside my soul, because the soul is where the mind, the will, the emotions, the thoughts, the intellect, the imagination, all of those things reside. See, we had no problem coming together physically, but we had a major problem coming together in every other way. And oftentimes when people hear the word intimacy, they make it synonymous with sex. But that is not the same thing. In essence, there are four types of intimacy. There's physical intimacy. There's spiritual intimacy. There's intellectual intimacy. And there is emotional intimacy. And when you begin to enter into the realm and connect in all four of these areas, you've truly reached what we call oneness. And so it made me think about a scripture that I want to put up on the screen. That's found in Genesis, the second chapter, 24 through the 25th verse. It says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And so when I look at this, I often think about those two words, one flesh. In essence, God wants us to enter into oneness. But oneness is not synonymous with sameness. See, God doesn't want us to be the same he wants us to become one. See, each and every one of us was created with our own uniqueness, 
our own individuality, our own self-expression. We're wired in a particular way. And God doesn't want us to be the same. He wants us to celebrate the diversity in the relationship and not look at it as a weakness, but look at it as a strength so you can enter into oneness. He's not looking for uniformity. He's looking for unity. And so when you understand that your spouse is not supposed to be just like you, because many of us, truth be told, we make the mistake of trying to fix our spouse, trying to fix our partner. But let's just say your spouse somehow was able to be conformed to become just like you. Well, if your spouse became just like you, then one of you would become obsolete. Because there's no need for two of you who are exactly the same. So you need the difference. You need the balance. You need the perspective. Because it gives you a comprehensive approach to life. For if everything were the way you saw it and the way you wanted it to be, there would be an imbalance. And so God wants us to be one, and that comes through celebrating the differences. But the challenge is, many of us don't reach this area of emotional intimacy because what we haven't realized is that there are seven levels that you have to go through to reach this intimacy. Now statistics would suggest that most couples only make it to the third level because of walls that have built up, because of unresolved issues, pains, hurts, and all the things that get in the midst of the relationship. And so I want to unpack for you in the next few minutes what these seven layers are, or seven levels are, so that you can see where you may be and how to get to the deepest levels that God would like to, us to have in the area of intimacy within our marriage. So, level number one is what we call cliches. Now, everybody knows what cliches are. Just think about it. Here in Atlanta, oftentimes when you go to, let's just say, the gas station, you get outside, you pump your gas, somebody else gets out their car, you make eye contact, hey, good morning, hey, good morning. Nice day, is oh yeah, what is beautiful. Like cliche conversations. Pleasantries, things you say just to be nice, just to be courteous. You're in a shopping line, right? You look back, you make eye contact, you greet one another because that is the nice thing to do. But oftentimes in the realm of relationships, our conversations are just like this, just cliche. Not detailed, not significant, no intimacy. How was work? Work was work. When we get together, all we do is talk about the bills and the babies and the responsibilities and work, but we don't reach the level of intimacy that we had before we said, I do. See, when we were dating each other, there was a level of intimacy that we no longer have because many of us, have. once we said, I do, we give up the relationship for the sake of the marriage. Well, what does that mean? Because I thought the marriage and the relationship were exactly the same. No, they're different. See, your relationship speaks to your companionship. Your marriage speaks to your partnership. See, your relationship speaks to your ability to emotionally connect, sexual fulfillment, the blending of personalities, effective communication. It is the heartfelt connection that you have with your partner. But your marriage speaks to your partnership, which represents responsibilities and delegation of tasks and parenting and financial responsibilities. They're two different things. So we find that some people have great relationships but horrible marriages. Some people on paper have great marriages, money in the bank, kids are taken care of, beautiful home, but they're not connected in their, in their marriage so they don't have a good relationship. And so there are different skills that you need for both in order for work to work. So in essence, what we want are great relationships and great marriages. Does that make sense? And so oftentimes we participate in these cliche relationships because statistics would also suggest that the average couple in the United States and the UK, they only talk for an average of four minutes a day. Did you know that? Four minutes of conversation. And oftentimes we're engaging in conversation at the two most inappropriate times of the day, as we're racing off to work in the morning and as we come home from an exhaustive day of work. And then we enter into our own separate worlds, into our own silos. And even when we're in the same space, we engage in what we call physical proximity. Now think about it. Think about the last time you were on the couch, you were on your phones flipping through social media, your spouse was flipping through channels on the TV. You're in close proximity, but there's no togetherness. See, togetherness is when your attention is either on each other or your attention is on the same thing. So we have to learn how to get past cliché into in-depth conversations that represent a sense of quality time. The second level of intimacy is what we will call the facts. Now, there are two types of facts. There are general facts, 
and then there are personal facts. Now, general facts is where many of us swim all day long. We, we do backstrokes in this all day. We can talk about politics all day. We can talk about a favorite TV show. We can talk about entertainment. We can talk about everybody else's relationship as long as we don't talk about our own because those conversations are safe. The general facts. Now, the personal facts we already know. Right? Because we've been together for 10 years, 15 years, 25 years, and we think because we've been together for so long, uh, there's not much to know about each other anymore. I figured it all out. I can finish your sentences. I know what you're thinking without you even saying it. We think that we've figured our partners out, but what we haven't realized is that we've just scratched the surface. You see, there's this concept called the moon to earth syndrome. Now think about it. When it, when it gets dark outside, look outside, wherever the moon may be, and you may notice that that moon will either be a full moon, a half moon, a crescent moon, you're going to see a different shape and dimension of the moon. Now, throughout 28 days, that moon will look quite different, representing the diversity in how it appears. But in essence, it's the same moon. But you're only seeing one face or one side of the moon. That in fact, if you wanted to see the other face or side of the moon, you would have to travel in a rocket ship into space, look down from a different angle to see what is considered to be the dark side of the moon. Well, guess what? We all have a dark side. And by dark, I don't mean wicked or evil or sinister. What I mean is that we all have an undiscovered side. And it is your responsibility as a spouse to tap into the things that you have yet to discover in your marriage. I've been married for 16 years, and every single day, I'm still discovering my spouse. But if you take the position, I already know what I need to know, there is an emotional disconnect that can occur. And oftentimes, couples go from being soulmates to roommates to roommates. Emotional disconnect. Because we stop at the facts. The third level of intimacy is what we would call opinions. Now that's when we kind of get in trouble because I remember the last time I shared my opinion, it didn't work out so well. Because I paid attention to your reaction. I saw how you responded. And in that moment, you taught me a critical lesson. Don't share your opinion. And so rather than having intimate conversations with one another, we wind up having internal conversations with ourselves. And so oftentimes when we engage in physical proximity, being in the same space at the same time, listen, communication is tricky, right? Because there's three components. There are your words, there's your tonality, and there's your facial expressions and body language. Now, your words are 7% of your communication. Your tonality is 23% of your communication, and your facial expressions and body language, 70%. And oftentimes we're looking at our spouse and we're interpreting what we believe they're communicating with their body language and we use that as a justification not to engage and so we wind up having these internal conversations. And so when we look at our spouse and say, well, what's going on? What do you think? Nothing. <laughs> and everything we want to say, we lock it in and don't say. Emotional disconnect walls continue to build. Let's go to the next level. Hopes and dreams. Remember when you first started dating? When you first got married? How you would hope, how you would dream? How you would hold hands and walk around the park, around the lake, and just dream of what life would be like. You would talk about the home that you would want, how many kids you want, right? The vacations you would go on, the businesses that you would form. How you would just take over the world. But then reality sets in. And disappointments said it, right? And broken promises said it. So the next time you have a dream that you want to share, either you remind yourself of your past failure and you tell yourself there's no point in hoping and dreaming because that's not being realistic. Or maybe the last time you attempted to share that dream, your spouse reminded you of all your past failures. And so you just don't dream anymore. And you settle for a life of normalcy. Because dreaming is what children do. We're adults now. We can't do that anymore. But it's that passion. It's that dream. It's that hope. It's that thing that you are yearning for and searching for and striving for that allows you to connect in a powerful way. But that's an element that you no longer have. The next level of intimacy. Feelings. 
Now, when you share your feelings, it requires a level of vulnerability. In the scripture, it said that they were naked and not ashamed. To become vulnerable means to become exposed. It means to become naked. Now think, if somebody were to strip all of my clothes off, immediately I would do this. Why? Because I'm protecting, right, what I perceive to be valuable, my most sacred possessions. And that's oftentimes what we do. Now, interestingly enough, many of us don't mind engaging in physical nakedness, but we have a major problem becoming emotionally naked, where we share our heart, our soul, our mind, our deepest thoughts and feelings, because oftentimes we feel as if we are not in a safe environment. And if I don't have a sense of safety, I'll hold on to that feeling until I feel safe. And because we haven't reached that sometimes, it prevents us from delving into this level of intimacy. The next level, faults, fears, and failures. Whew. This is where the criticism comes in. And I don't need to be reminded by you about my faults because I beat myself up every single day about my faults in the burdens and the struggles and the realities of, of what I have to do as a man or as a woman, I'm already thinking about these issues and because they're constantly on my mind, or the last time you critique me, that's constantly on my mind and it's reverberating again and again and again. It keeps me from connecting and engaging and establishing emotional intimacy that can turn this entire relationship around because of faults, fears, and failures. I remember three years into the marriage, before things turned around, my wife thought that I was a robot. She thought that I was an android, that I had no emotions, that I had no feeling or compassion or, in, or anything. And I remember in the midst of a heated argument, it's almost like I had an out-of-body experience, and I saw myself defeated in this continuous engagement of verbal attacks. And it was in that moment that I became very silent. And it took me 10 minutes literally to form my lips to say to her that for the first time in my life, I feel like a failure. The amount of ego and pride that was in me that kept me from forming those words, but I was so defeated in that moment, it eventually came out. But along with those words, I began to wail like a baby in her lap. And instantly, it changed her perspective of me. Because for the first time in three years, she said, he is human. He does have a heart. He does care. He is emotional. See, men and women have the same number of emotions, but we just manage them differently. And so oftentimes, men suppress. Now think about it. If you've ever had a cold before, right? Let's just say you had a very bad headache. People tell you to take what? Um, Tylenol, Advil, to suppress the pain. If you have a runny nose, they say take mucinex or, or, or therapy. Why? To suppress the mucus. If you have a sore throat, they'll say take top, they'll say what? Take throat lozenges to suppress the cough. And oftentimes we're so busy suppressing and suppressing and suppressing that we think when the symptom is gone, the sickness is gone. But guess what? The, sis, the sickness is still lying dormant within you. And anything can trigger it to cause it to come back out. But if you've ever been so sick where you've vomited, as violent and as excruciating as that may be, you're forcing the sickness out of you. And have you ever noticed after vomiting how instantly you'll feel better? Because you're forcing it out. And oftentimes when you emotionally suppress everything in you, not only are you dying internally, but it can represent the death of your relationship. So we have to learn how to release so that we can connect in a significant way. The next level of intimacy legitimate needs. See, when you reach a point where you can unpack your thoughts, your feelings, and your emotions in a true, intimate, vulnerable way, where you're willing to expose your woundedness before your partner, you're willing to truly become one naked emotionally and not ashamed, you reach a place where you can reach each other's legitimate needs. Because once my wife understood who I was at my core and what I was in need of, she knew how to meet that need and vice versa. And so in your marriage, you have to understand that one of your responsibilities is to help your partner become the best version of themselves. 
is to help your partner reach a place in their life where they find fulfillment because they're partnering with you to experience something with you that they couldn't experience by themselves. That's the benefit and the joy of marriage. See, marriage is a God idea. He has so many intentions in designed for this particular union. We often focus on the benefits of marriage, but don't focus on the purpose of marriage. One of the purposes is to help meet each other's legitimate needs. But this can only happen when you reach a depth level of intimacy within your relationship. And so I would encourage each and every one of you that as you begin to work on your relationships, do the work that's required. Go to the, the seventh level of intimacy and unpack the richness that's within your union. It kind of reminds me of a story that I'm going to close with. Because oftentimes we want to give up, call it quits, we get discouraged because things aren't happening the way that we want them to happen. But if you keep pressing and if you keep pushing, eventually something's going to break and turn in your favor. It reminds me of the story that I once heard about a man who had some Chinese bamboo tree seeds and he wanted to grow a Chinese bamboo tree in his backyard. So he bought these seeds, dug a hole in his backyard, took these seeds, put them in the ground, and according to the Chinese bamboo tree, now this is a fact, it takes five years to grow. And so there he is watering the, the ground and, and nurturing the soil. Year one comes around, nothing comes up out of the ground, but he understands how it grows. So a few months into the second year, he's still committed, he's diligent, he has tenacity, he's watering the soil, he's allowing the sunlight to hit it in such the appropriate way, but year three, nothing comes up out of the soil yet. So his next door neighbor comes over and says, hey Bob, uh, what you doing? He says, I'm over here growing my Chinese family tree. He says, I've been uh, watching you attempt to grow this tree for three years, and uh, I haven't seen anything come out of the ground yet. He said, that's okay. I know what I'm doing. I'm growing my Chinese bamboo tree. Year four into the process, still nothing comes up out of the ground. But the first day into the fifth year, a sprout pops up out of the ground. And within five weeks, that Chinese bamboo tree grew 90 feet tall into the sky. This is literally how this tree grows. And so the question becomes, did it take five weeks for the Chinese bamboo tree to grow, or did it take five years? The reality is it took five years. But if he had ever stopped watering the ground, nurturing the soil, allowing the sunlight to hit it, then that dream or that tree would have died in the ground. And so there are times in your relationship when you're going through turmoil, you have to realize that it's just for a season. See, my wife and I were exactly where you were just a few years ago. And I believe that today we're a walking, talking miracle because if we can make it, anybody can make it. And so oftentimes when we share, we share from our personal experiences and the struggles that we've gone through to, to give couples hope that they can make it through. Regardless of the way it looks at this moment, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. But it requires that you partner with God to do what's necessary. See, oftentimes when we pray, we're saying, God, please change the situation. Turn our situation around. And you're waiting for God to do something. And he's waiting for you to do something. See, God does not work for you. He works through you. And so when we seek his presence and apply his principles found in the word, our marriage begins to blossom and grow like those seeds that were in the ground. And so I don't want you to get discouraged because you say, well, we've been in this space too long. Just keep sowing. Just keep planting. Just keep watering. Because eventually, you are going to reap a harvest. You know, it was T.D. Lawrence who said, all men dream, but not equally. Those men who dream at night in the dusty recesses of their minds awaken to find that it was but vanity. But those who dream by day, these are the dangerous ones where they dream with their eyes open to make sure that their dreams come true. If you have a dream for a successful marriage, keep your eyes open. Keep focusing on the goal. Because eventually, if you remain committed to the process, you will be extremely successful. There were times when we felt like giving up, caving in, and quitting. But we realized that not only did we owe it to each other to stick in the fight, but we owe it to our children. We owe it to ourselves. And most importantly, we owe it to God. God is the glue, the crux, the core, the foundation of your union. And as long as you both begin to seek him and pursue him, you will meet each other exactly where he's at. So I just want to encourage you today as we close in prayer. 
I reached my time. So if we bow our heads, I'll pray. Father God, I thank you for every individual who's in this room today. I thank you for their commitment, for their tenacity, for their willingness to do what is necessary to turn their relationships around. There's a blessing that comes with the union. Your word says that when two come together, we are blessed. That's what marriage is. It's a blessing. And there's a purpose beyond the benefit of the union. Help them to realize, Father God, what they got into this relationship for. Help them to realize that you are as much as this, of a part of this covenant as they are. Help them to do the work that is necessary. Father God, open up their eyes to see, their ears to hear, their hearts to receive from one another. I pray that spiritual and emotional and intellectual and physical intimacy will enter into their home. Whatever strife that has been in their marriage, we cast that spirit out and ask that your presence of peace and love and joy will rule, rest, and abide in each and every one. We pray that today will represent the first day of the rest of their lives together on their path to fulfillment within their marriage. And that it would be glorious to you because they're living out the call for marriage that you have upon their lives. So we thank you in advance for the success of these marriages. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.